Thanks for thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, we're back. Um, we are so excited to be here. Uh, thank you again for joining. Um, we got a, a great lineup of, of content to go through today. I uh, can't wait to hear from from all of our speakers. First up, we got uh, Hobbs. Uh, he, he's going to take us through some UI and UX design best practices. Uh, and then after that, Jay is going to uh, talk about uh, how to go about gathering uh, dashboard and report requirements. Um, and then finally, I'm going to wrap up with a uh, walkthrough of uh, some really cool stuff you can do with Tableau's new set controls uh, and set uh, action capabilities. So uh, definitely looking forward to that as well. Uh, before we kick into the content, I just want to go over a couple of community upgrades, updates uh, around the Tableau community. Uh, all, of, all throughout July is uh, certifiably Tableau month, uh, which is really cool. Uh, anybody, you can get 10% off uh, uh, certification tests uh, throughout through the end of July. Uh, and one really cool thing that Tableau is doing is for every test that is sold, uh, Tableau is going to donate a certification uh, desktop specialist uh, certification uh, to uh, to uh, black led and equity focused uh, organizations, uh, which is a, a really great cause. So kudos to Tableau for doing that. Um, next up, we've got uh, if you're interested in speaking. Uh, we all know by now that the Tableau conference is going to be virtual this year. Uh, there, we're still sorting out the details of what all that's going to look like um, and feel like and uh, be like. But um, if you want to uh, have an opportunity to speak at any future virtual Tableau uh, things, could be you know your customer story, could be use cases. Uh, stuff like that. Definitely want to check out the uh, Tableau Speaker Bureau program. Um, you can, it's on their web, on Tableau's website. Uh, you fill out a form, talk about your story, uh, and submit that by July 31st to be uh, in consideration uh, for future Tableau events. So that's not just TC. That's uh, any virtual uh, any virtual event in the future. So they've got all their different verticals. Uh, so the uh, government uh, summit, the healthcare summit, uh, the IT summit, and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, just check out their website. It's all there. Uh, and we all know that uh, with schools kind of in who knows what's going on, um, Tableau's put together a really cool initiative uh, using the community. Uh, they've created uh, a handful of really cool uh, data and data visualization related uh, projects to introduce your uh, your young kids uh, to data and data visualization. Uh, so check out their website uh, to check that out. And um, this is a picture of my son, uh, Mason. He uh, is really into uh, volcanoes right now. So I kind of, uh, kind of blew his mind when I said, well, let's go look at every single uh, volcano in the world. And he didn't know that that was even a thing you could do. So, um, and then I just kind of let him, I turned my machine over to him and let him play in Tableau. And it was a really cool discovery uh, for him. He, he really enjoyed that bubble chart. So this was more about discovery and enjoying the, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll tackle uh, best practices and data visualization at a later lesson, but. Um, all right, so before we kick into uh, some of the content, just a few other housekeeping items. Um, we've got, uh, there's two things. One, there's uh, two ways that you can interact with us today. We've got the chat. Uh, the chat is how you can interact with everyone else. Um, so interact with all of uh, anybody who's uh, in the meeting. Uh, talk about talk about the weather and talk about our half a billion dollar quarterback. Um, talk about really whatever you want. Uh, and then there's the Q&A. The Q&A is going to be specifically for, uh, for the speakers. So, uh, so that's kind of how we're going to monitor and kind of triage things. So if you have a question for the speaker, put that in the Q&A. If you want to talk about whatever, uh, potpourri, if you will, uh, then that goes in the, uh, in the chat. So uh, with any, without further ado, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Hobbs. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hobbs. It's good to meet you all. 
I am going to be talking about some UI UX stuff, but before I do, um, like many of you, I'm working from home. And as a heads up, I have four small children and I also have a contractor doing some work on my house. Uh, so I apologize in advance. I've turned the gain on my microphone absolutely to the bottom. If the background noise gets horrendous, someone just interrupt me and I can like move to later in the presentation or something, but I think it'll be okay. You guys are just gonna have to let me know. So these are some of the joys of working from home. That said, uh, let's go ahead and get into sort of what I want to talk about today. So I, one of my favorite parts of doing data stuff is working with um, the end users and helping them to have a good experience with what they're doing because I've been on a lot of data projects where, I mean, 95% of the time goes into the data side of things and the end user never actually experiences that. Uh, and so they end up being frustrated because what you get at the end of that process is something uh, that is kind of unattractive or difficult to work with. So I started doing some research on gestalt design principles and um, talking about a few different topics and reading about things. Um, and what I came away with was a few principles that I now try and walk my mind through anytime I'm working on a report. So that's what I'd like to go through today. There are about eight of these that I have as suggestions. And to prove that they are valuable, um, what I do anytime I give this talk is I go online and I pick a random publicly available uh, report that I think is okay but not great. And I walk through my checklist on it and save each step so that you can see sort of what it looks like from beginning to end. And then you get to judge at the end whether or not you think this is a valuable process to go through. So uh, let's look at a few of those examples. The first thing that I'm going to suggest when you are designing dashboards um, is that the entire shape of your dashboard, they've done a lot of research around um, heat mapping, around eye movement around screens on websites and whatnot. And there are two general formats that are highly suggested for website design and graphic design, infographics, and in this case, reporting as well. And that is to shape the report either like a capital letter F or capital letter Z. What does that mean? If you think about the Facebook homepage and what it looks like, you sort of, your eyes start at the top, you're gonna read across something and then go back to the left-hand side, scroll down a little way, see another thing, read across, scroll down, read across. Uh, so that's sort of that F design there. And then a lot of websites also have a design where they want you to read the title at the very top, skim across the middle, and they've got ad other additional information at the bottom. Um, so let me show you the report that I did this for. And I literally did this this morning. So I didn't, I don't, prep a lot of this in advance. I think if the rules are good, uh, then they'll work wherever you might apply them. This is from Tableau Public. I went to, if you go to Tableau Public and start searching through the pages, um, you can start at the beginning or the end. So I went to the very end of Tableau Public, which I think was page 154. Uh, and on page 154, I started looking for something that I thought was okay, but not great. This is how the report is initially. Uh, it's got obviously some simple interactions here, as well as this is a 100% stacked column chart or bar chart, excuse me, some metadata down at the bottom and then some different banks here with some text at the top. You don't have to care about the data for our purposes. That's not terribly important. Um, I hope that these principles, because they're graphic design principles, can apply regardless of your data set. So here's what we started with. The changes as I go through each of these will be fairly subtle in most cases. Um, it's the cumulative effect that they have that I think really pops and makes things look good. So I went through this report and very subtly arranged things so that it has a, a slightly closer to that capital letter F view. If I, if I go back here, you'll notice just a few things. One, this was center aligned and I left aligned it so that you can just read across each of these lines. And I took this where you're having to read sort of top to bottom and I laid it out horizontally down here 
at the bottom of the report. Is this dramatically better? No, not exactly, right? But it's a, it's a minor improvement over what was going on before. For the rest of these slides, uh, I've tried to do something and I, I, I challenge you to tell me whether or not I am correct about these things. I'm gonna open up the chat just in case someone actually responds to this. Uh, but so on these slides, I'm going to try and manipulate your brain into doing something very specific. Uh, and hopefully if I've done my job, it works every time. So you'll see what I mean here in a moment. When you read this, I suspect that what your brain did is it came across here and read size matters from left to right. It did not go size and then matters or size and then matters. Why is that? Because size matters, right? <laughs> because the size of something gives you an indication that it belongs together. Um, when you make two things large, your brain assumes that they have something in common. The brain is always looking for these patterns um, and similarities inside of things to see how it is it can combine them and get them moved together. So let's look at how that applies in a particular circumstance here. So we started here, we move forward. I rearranged only very slightly on a few of these things. Oh, so Keith Gates is telling me that I'm a liar and he got his brain worked things differently. So yeah, I can't, obviously, it's not gonna work all the time, but I think a lot of people, this is, this is the way that they're gonna naturally see things. Uh, but by all means, call me out if this doesn't work for you. So here we are applying the size matters principle, right? All I've done here, um, there's a book that I really enjoy called Don't Make Me Think, uh, which is mostly about website design, but the principles apply in a lot of different places. And he talks about um, sort of the fundamental science of the way the brain interprets visual information. And his suggestion is that when you're making text different sizes, you make three different sizes, big, medium, and small, and that they be dramatically different. The more different they are, the more easily your brain will move between these three things. So I have not followed that advice precisely, uh, but I made this top section here significantly larger, right? And in order to do that, I had to remove some of the text that's inside of here. Um, I shrunk some of this down and then I added at the top here, again in bold, a title for the visual. Is that dramatically better? No, no it's not. But it is very marginally better, in my opinion, than this is. If size matters, what else matters to the brain as it's going through things? Um, and the fact of the matter is that color matters, right? And hopefully we'll see if uh, Mr. Gates proves me wrong again here, but your brain probably followed this color scheme. It goes, wait a minute, those are both red. Why is that? What do those things have in common? And your eye is drawn to this portion of the screen um, in a way that it uh, sort of proves to your mind that the color of things is important as you go through this. In order to do that, I made, <laughs> awesome, it worked for Keith this time. Um, in order to do that, I made some subtle changes to this visual. So I took one of the words here um, at the very top and I made it the color, and I'm gonna use this more potently a little bit later on, right? But I made this the same color as the darkest color here to give you the impression that slowness is connected to this color, that slowness is bad, it's red, right? And that where we see red, I should not have to even really look down here at these data labels, I should interpret slow, right? That's, that builds a connection between those two things. I'm also a big believer in the fact that distance matters. Typically, we read left to right, right? But when you group things in this way, you're, you're likely gonna go down. You're gonna go from distance to matters and then move over here to this other matter simply because they're farther apart. Now, in this instance, um, distance is especially important regarding white space. 
white space gives your brain, if you will, kind of room to breathe in. I don't know if, I don't remember the last, I don't remember the official numbers, but I was reading about the amount and uh, speed at which data is being produced worldwide. Uh, and we're now on a very regular basis producing as much data as existed in all of human history up until this point. Um, most of us are expected to take in vast quantities of data very quickly on a regular basis. And our reports kind of reflect that. My experience with reporting is that it gets cluttered really fast. And as soon as you take it to your end users, they're going to have 30 more things they want you to add, a whole list of extra filters and several more visuals and um, some headers and whatnot, and it becomes crowded and difficult to think straight. Now, I'm particularly picky about this because I have difficulty concentrating when there's a lot going on around me. I like my desk to be clean. I like my office to be clean. I like it to be fairly quiet, which, as I've said, makes it a little difficult to work from home. Uh, but so for me, distance in particular, I find to matter. Not just in white space, though. When you put things close together, the brain interprets that. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, you can do some research into gestalt design principles. That's the, some of the concepts that feed this. Um, but your brain thinks that those things are related somehow. It says, well, they're close together, so they must have something in common. And it will try and connect those dots as best it's able to. Applying that concept, I made a few very subtle changes between these two things. Um, I spaced this inward just slightly so I have some white space along this border and along this border. I aligned my edges neatly to form a grid. Um, I know in Tableau you've got sort of, uh, I'm, I'm team float, I guess you would say. I'm not interested in the, the snapping to certain spaces inside of the dashboards. Uh, I'm sure that's a controversial topic, but I like my things to float on the screen so I can position them precisely where I want them. So I floated these over so that they aligned nicely here. I built in a little more space between this opening text at the top and the visual down below just to give you a mental break. And ideally, again, if I've done my job well, your eye goes here as a group, right? It looks at this as something that has... Uh, elements in common. Then it skips down to this second section here. The legend and the visual are close together. So again, hopefully your brain connects them. And then this information at the bottom is separated quite a bit in distance. Uh, and I also applied the size matters here. It's very small text. So hopefully you don't even realize that's there, more or less. That's the goal I'm trying to accomplish with that. Is it an enormous improvement? No, it's not. That's not the point. The point is that each of these makes a subtle difference that cumulatively is going to give you a much better report. Grouping also matters. There are several ways to do grouping inside of uh, reporting. If you're going to use background color is one of the most common ones. You can use objects as well and images, rectangles, or what not to sort of build rounded edges on things and make it all fancy. But essentially, if something has a boundary around it, your brain assumes, again, that those things are connected in some way. And this is a principle I like to use a lot, to draw people's eyes to the portion of the visual that I care about. This is one of the more, if you will, dramatic changes uh, in the, from the original report when we get here. Um, all I have done is created some bounding to create three areas. The header at the top is now bounded. Then you've got the report that I want you to look at here in the middle. And then down at the bottom, I have added a bottom boundary so that your eyes aren't looking down here or off to the sides. And you sort of make these invisible lines connecting the four corners of this report page. You'll notice one other thing I did. Uh, this section here where it talks about comparing mortgage servicers, this is information about how the report was made and how to interact with the report. Because I don't want people dwelling on that, I've moved it down here to the bottom and put it inside of its own box. And then further, I've labeled it information and how to so that people understand what it is they're looking at as they go through this process. 
So using boundaries, I have connected pieces of information together and given your eye a spot to land. Similarity also matters. I'll be honest, when I was looking at this report and thinking about this principle, um, I had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out how to apply this one. The way I commonly apply it is on a dashboard with multiple visuals. If I, if I want the visuals to be viewed together, if I think that they relate to one another, there's some correlations between these different uh, concepts and a business outcome, then I'll make them the same kind of visual, right? So you make a series of bar charts, you make them the same size, you put them together, you put a boundary around them, and the person is inherently going to draw connections between those things. Contrasting that, if you have two sets of information that you really want to mostly be considered separately from one another, maybe a business user has asked them both to be on the same page, so you're working within those boundaries, uh, but honestly, you think this is two separate sets of information. I don't want you to think about these in the same way. Creating different kinds of visuals, picking a visual type, bars and column charts, for example, for one set of information and a different set for the second set of information, using that similarity will draw the person's mind to make these sort of uh, different conclusions when looking at the data. Now, my visual is just one, right? I picked one randomly from uh, Tableau Public. There's only one visual here to interact with, so I thought, all right, what could I do for similarity? And what I decided to do here, uh, and I didn't have time to flesh it out all the way right, but I've added in a reference line here for people who are uh, beyond 40% uh, in the number of claims that are falling into this slowest category. And then I rearranged some to get some of these people who tend towards slowness up towards the top to give you the sense that there is a lot of similarity between those things. If I'm being frank, uh, that's, that's fair, a fairly weak example. Um, but since I didn't want to create extra visuals as I thought that would be cheating, this is about as good as I could do using similarity as a principle for this particular Tableau Public Report. The next principle I'd like you to think about is the principle of focus. Our attention is really a rather limited resource. We don't have a lot of time we don't have a lot of energy. All of us are being asked to multitask harder and faster every single day. Probably there are people on this call right now who are listening to me uh, and are also working at the same time, right? This is the world we live in and it's difficult to get people to pay attention to something in particular. Using some of the principles that we've talked about already, where you put things, uh, how they're similar to one another, whether or not you group them, the use of color, you can draw people's focus inward. And what I'd like you to do with the next report you create is decide the first and most important thing you want whoever looks at this to see. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, they may never get any further than that, right? We put a lot of love into the reports that we make, uh, and oftentimes they get only a cursory glance. So really challenge yourself to say, what's the thing I want someone to see in this context? In order to accomplish that here, I would select this color category, right? The other colors are there, but I have absolutely drawn your focus in and now nicely tied in the color I used for the word slower here so that you get this clean progression across the stream, screen, excuse me, from the idea of slowness up at the top used in the header to the highlight of the slowest categories here and then down finally at the bottom to the selected color in my legend. I'm using that and it also highlights nicely this reference line that I've created to really draw your mind to how slow these particular industries are in relation to the loans that are being talked about in this data set. I have one more principle here uh, that I'm going to go through um, and that relates to a law that I read, I was reading through some of the, you'll, you'll find these articles like the laws of UX design and whatnot. And one of them was named after an individual and he said uh, very pithily that 
people spend most of their time on other people's stuff, right? So if you're building a report, people spend the majority of their time on other people's reports. If you're building a website, people spend the majority of their time on other people's websites. So people are spending the majority of their time elsewhere, which means they want what you've made to feel like what everybody else has made. My example for this, uh, I think one of the easiest ways to apply this concept is with icons. So if you see this icon, your brain probably knows what this does. It's got an arrow, it's pointing backwards. You go, okay, this is some kind of go back arrow or an undo button possibly, but the shape of this is familiar to you. And if I asked you, where should this button go on your screen? I hope that most of you will immediately picture in your head the top left corner. Why is that? That's because that's where web browsers put it, right? Um, I haven't worked in Safari in a long time, but I know that in Internet Explorer and Chrome and Microsoft Edge uh, and in Mozilla, right, and some of these others, that top left corner is the back button. And we're so used to browsing the Internet uh, that this is where we just expect it to be. If you opened a web browser and found this icon in the bottom right hand corner or in the middle bottom of the screen, that would absolutely throw you for a loop. Why is that? It's not, it's not like the position actually matters all that much. And it's because you spend most of your time on other people's websites, right? Uh, you spend most of your time working with these commonly identified places and schemas, meanings of things that you hardly even realize are a part of your vocabulary. The way I like to implement this, especially if I'm going to be working long term with a client and building a whole series of reports for them, uh, is to start to introduce a series of maybe five icons and then use them consistently in all of my reports. The consistency is important because if I include an information button in one report and then in the next report I leave it off, people stop paying attention to it. But if in every report I have, in the top right-hand corner, there's a more information button, um, slowly but surely that will become a part of their understanding of how these reporting tools work. And it, I can use that to my advantage. When I build them a new report, they don't have to ask themselves, where's the information button going to be, right? It'll always be in this same spot. Um, doing that inside of this tool, um, I could have added some navigation in here in the top and bottom. But the simplest way to do that is down here in the bottom, I added the information icon. Even if you don't read this title, right, I could probably remove information and how to. And if I left this icon here, the person would still understand the purpose of this information at the bottom of the screen. Um, that's the power of using iconography in what you're doing. If you're introducing people for the first time to interactive reporting, it can be helpful to put a little hand icon, right? The clicking finger that you'll see sometimes next to one of the titles and start doing this consistently in your report in places where you want interaction. And then if you don't want interaction, don't include that icon, right? Uh, and so people will build up this vocabulary where they don't have to read, they can glance at something and visually receive a message from you about how the report should work as you're going through these things. These principles, working with the shape of the report, right? Using, I, I really like the capital letter F approach where you've got something along the very top of the screen is something down the left-hand side and then reading left to right as you move across the screen. Making sure that sizes are meaningful. If you're gonna have a really large header, that's great. Make sure that uh, other headers are the, that have the same kind of information, right? Have the same size of header inside of them. If you've got four visuals and they each have a different size of title, that's going to bother people, especially people like me who are picky about that sort of thing. So make sure that size matters, that you're paying attention to that. Use color to represent concepts. In mine, I'm using the color red to indicate slow, and I tie that together across the entire report. It would be irresponsible of me as a report designer to then make red, if I added another visual in here, right, to have red mean something else because I've spent this time and energy to help the report consumer see red as a meaningful thing. So don't swap that out. Pick a color, have it mean one thing in your report, and that's it. 
I also strongly encourage you to stick to small color palettes. Um, three, four colors, maybe five colors at the absolute most. Gradients are often better unless you've got distinct categories. If you've only got three sales regions or something, sure, give them each their own color to work with. But make sure that you're not reusing those colors elsewhere inside of your report. Distance things out. Give yourself some white space around the boundaries of things. If you want people to look at an area, um, make sure that it's close together with other things that matter as you go. Group things together. I really like these uh, background blocky uh, images or just filling in the background color of a given container uh, to draw your eyes to the different sections and to guide you through the port as you're moving along. If you want uh, visuals to be seen side by side, if you want them to be considered holistically, design them similarly, right? Make them look like they belong together. And you can use the opposite principle. If you want them to be considered separately, make sure that as you go through that, uh, that you are designing those with different visual effects. Is that over? Uh, I'll answer that. I got a question in the q and I'll answer that in just a moment here. Um, so make sure that you are drawing people's eyes to where you want them to go um, by putting visuals that you like sort of side by side. Finally, pick one thing. Pick just one thing that you want someone to see and draw their eyes to that thing. We're not really going to take in five or 10 things unless we're committed. And to get people committed, you have to grab their attention right off the bat with something important that matters to them, which is why if you're building reports, they should always result in the end user taking an action of some kind. If you've got a business user who wants a report and you say, all right, what's your, what are you gonna do with this information? And they can't tell you, they probably don't need a report. We don't need any more information for information's sake. It has got to come back to something that you are actually going to do with the information that you've been provided. And once you know that business action, right? What, what's the insight you need to do a thing? Then you cannot bring all of the focus to making sure that they understand, do I need to do the thing? Yes or no. And the other parts of the visual should just give them further context and insight on how to take the action that they're expecting to need to take. This is the, uh, in my opinion, sort of the big ta-da moment. This is what we started with. And honestly, it's just fine, right? There's nothing terribly wrong with this. It's not breaking a lot of rules or anything. But applying these steps one after the other through incremental changes, I think this is a much more attractive and easy to understand report at the end of the day. So I'm gonna go ahead and open myself up. I've got about five minutes left. I don't think I'm running long. Sean, if I'm running long, then cut me off. Uh, but I've got two questions here in the QA. I'm gonna pull that over to my screen so that you guys can see these questions. Sean, am I good on time? Yeah, you're doing good. All right, sweet. Uh, so uh, Brittany asked, do you have any thoughts on long scrolling versus wide scrolling dashboards? I try to avoid introducing any scrolling at all if I can possibly do so. Um, but if I have to have scrolling, uh, I usually want people to scroll down. This is because most people spend most of their time on other people's websites, right? When you go to Facebook, where do you scroll? You scroll down. You know, when you're reading through your news feed, where do you scroll? You scroll down. So to ask people to scroll sideways is an unintuitive experience for them, and most people don't like it. Uh, so if I'm designing things, I like to work with, uh, if I'm gonna build a, a dashboard that is longer or larger than the screen, I'm gonna make it go down, not off to the right or left, if that makes sense. Um, what are your thoughts on borders on multiple charts on a dashboard? I dislike, um, it's probably just my opinion. You, the rest of you on the panel might have other opinions. I don't like just putting a border, border line around my charts and visuals. Um, I tend to like blocks of color. Um, so I'd make the, you know, the entire background dark gray and then the background of each visual white so that there's sort of these white boxes, a cutout look, if you will, um, for the visuals inside of it. I would not simply use a borderline to indicate 
um, where a visual stops and starts. I, I prefer blocks of color instead. Do you have any additional resources you would suggest on UX UI best practices? Um, so there's, honestly, what I'm gonna say is do a Google search for Gestalt design principles. Gestalt design principles are widely used in graphic design communities. Uh, what they were attempting to do was define ways that the brain thinks automatically. Uh, it's saying these are not things that you have to cause someone to do, they just do them. This is the way the brain takes in visual information. And understanding that you can make sort of the gold standard of good reporting often uh, other than accuracy, right, is intuitiveness. Does it make sense? Uh, and if it makes sense, you've done a good job. So understanding how the brain works will get you a long ways towards those goals. So do a Google search um, for Gestalt design principles. That will take you a long ways. Many of the things that I just walked you through are stolen directly <laughs> from people better than me at this sort of thing who have those suggestions. Uh, I got a question in the chat. Oh, it looks like they moved it over. Okay. Um, why use the bar chart where all the items total 100% and then bother to sort by the number of trials, which isn't quantified to know how many more one company did versus another? Why not sort who has the largest percent of slower? John, that is an excellent uh, suggestion. And when I do this presentation, um, I very specifically pick something the exact same day I'm doing the presentation to apply the principles because I don't want to be one of those guys who spends a week making a report look beautiful and then says, hey, guess what? You can do this too. It's so easy. Uh, so what you're suggesting is better, right? Uh, the suggestion to instead sort in that way to bring the total percentage up to the top is better than what I did. And for those of you watching, do what John said, not what I said in that particular instance. What's the best size you use when you work on browsers and phone and do you use a particular custom palette? I don't tend to use a custom color palette unless I have branding requirements from a client that I'm working with. Um, otherwise, I just use the ones that are pre-built by Tableau. They've put far more research into them than I possibly have time to research. They've also done a very good job making them accessible to people who are colorblind uh, and some other things in there. So honestly, use what people have given you unless you've got a very good reason to not do so. Um, ooh, got a lot of questions. Yeah, John is correct yet again. You could then add a number at the end of the bar with the totals. Um, filter sometimes can be an ISO on a dashboard. I frequently use dashboard actions to avoid filters. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm fairly ambivalent about that. I, I know for a long time there was a push towards people saying that screen real estate is really valuable. Uh, but more and more, I'm finding that my report consumers have gotten used to navigating between pages. And as soon as you get them comfortable with more than one page, you've got more real estate back again. Um, so someone else may have a stronger question or a stronger opinion about that than I do, but I, I don't have particularly strong suggestions one way or the other. I think I'm probably at time. So thank you for all of your questions. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed this. I'm very quickly before you go, gonna put up a little information about me in case you wanna hunt me down, you're welcome to find me on LinkedIn and I do a video blog as well. And I think with that, I'm gonna give things back again. That was, <clears throat> that was really great. Uh, <clears throat> I took away so much from that, so. Definitely got some things that you can take um, and apply um, as soon as as soon as you get off of this uh, this call. So, really awesome stuff. Thanks again. All right, thanks for the questions, uh, everybody. Uh, everybody's doing great on that. Next up, we've got uh, Jay Farias from Evolytics, and he's going to talk about some dashboard and report requirements. Hey everybody. Uh, thanks Hops. Really liked your talk. And one thing that I took away from that was the, uh, like the clicky, the clicky mouse icon. I think 
like at least me, I'm in Tableau so much that I forget that other people don't know that everything is like clickable or hoverable. Um, and some of our clients, you know, will come to us, they're just getting on Tableau and they just like put that there to remind them or just to not remind them, but to let them know that it is interactive and they can click on things and hover on things. So I think that's a good point. Um, it's one thing I took away. All right, does everybody see my screen with the, the title? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about requirements gathering. Um, so I think this is the, one of the toughest and most crucial steps in building dashboards for business stakeholders. Um, if you fail to understand what your stakeholders are really after, then you greatly risk producing a dashboard that will be late, over budget, you know, maybe incomplete. So this is where a requirements template can save the day. Now, a quality template that captures both the overall goal and the nitty gritty details is a lifesaver. All right, so a little about me. My name is Jay Ferris. I'm the data viz manager at Evolytics. Uh, I've been in Tableau for about four years or so, four to five years, um, and manage the data viz practice there. Um, and, you know, I've spoken at a few times before, so I like, I like teaching and training as well. Okay, so why you need a template? Um, so making efficient use of the time you have with your stakeholder sets the project in the right course, especially right now when we're meeting virtually and you know you can't just, if you're in an office with people, you can't just walk over and ask them questions repeatedly. You know, maybe it's some way to halfway across the country and you know, you're not in the same time zone. So an inefficient requirements meeting can lead to missed requirements, um, an unclear dashboard purpose, you know, unnecessary communication down the line, guessing by the analyst if they can't get a hold of the stakeholder and just wasted time. And besides the benefit of a quality dashboard, having and following a template promotes good habits and it's a great way to train new developers. So in this presentation, I'll share an outline of the template we use here at Evolytics that I helped to develop. So our template has six main sections. Um, I'll explain each section and provide a few of the main questions that we like to ask when interviewing stakeholders. Now there's a new blog post up on evolytics.com with a starter template for you to download. That's basically this document you see right here. Um, I just put it up today. So no company or developer is gonna have the same process. So I advise, using, I advise using it as a starting point and then modifying it to fit your business needs. So we have six sections in our template. We have the dashboard purpose, the design, data discovery, existing reporting, publishing and sharing, and then just a miscellaneous section. All right, the purpose. I think this is the most important part, right? So the main goal with this section is understanding why they need the information and what action they will perform with it. Like, what are they gonna do with the dashboard? So this will help you as a developer understand the true purpose of the dashboard and make sure the metrics, the design, like everything aligns with that goal. If you understand the goal, then you can ask yourself, does this you know, provide value towards that goal? So some sample questions we ask are, you know, who are the audiences? Who's gonna be using the dashboard? What are their business questions? You know, what, what are they gonna have in their mind when they come to the dashboard that they want answered? What KPIs answer those business questions? And then are those KPIs actionable? Like, can you do something with, those, with the information that's on the dashboard? So let's look at an example of the dashboard purpose, like some answers we would get when asking this question. Now this is from a project I'm just finishing up right now. So audiences, uh, our stakeholder told us that the audience is gonna be marketing managers and strategists. One of the business questions that they wanna answer are, what are users doing after they log into the product? And some KPIs that support, support this question are the bounce rate, creating goals, user count, adding accounts, user count, and visiting marketplace, user count. Now the audience of managers and strategists let me know that the KPIs might be pretty detailed. It also gives me a hint as to how I might design the dashboard later, which we'll talk about in the next section. So the business question is pretty clear and I think the KPIs answer it. So do our users take no action after they log in, which would be, we would see in the bounce rate, or do they add goals, uh, accounts, or visit the marketplace? Now it's also important to ask follow-up questions and understand what we are counting with these metrics. If you're not 100% sure of what they mean when they give you a metric, you really need to hone in on it. So with this, in marketing analytics, we could have three different meetings from these. 
we could have, is that the number of users who take that action, that distinct count of users, or is it the number of sessions where that action is taken, or is it the total number of times that action happens? You know, a user could create five goals when they're there. So is that a count of five or is that a count of one? So those are really important questions that you need to ask when you're used, when your stakeholders give you a metric. Now, are the KPIs actionable? Well, yes, if we noticed that one of the count metrics was vastly lower than the others, we could go see if like a link was broken or the navigation was broken or something like that. It would tell us that, hey, something's wrong. And if we ran a campaign to promote visiting the marketplace, then we should see a rise in that metric. So, you know, A, it gets B. Uh, it's also important to, that you capture clear answers to these questions and solidify them with your stakeholder upfront because that lets you limit scope creep later in the project. You know, if they're asking for more stuff later down the line, like, well, this is what we agreed on. You know, we had that meeting, you signed off on this. Like I can do that, but we're gonna have to take something away. You know, it's good to have those conversations and keep them, keep them accountable. All right, now getting into dashboard design. So design in the business world isn't terribly exciting. We all know what we see on public is a far cry from the dashboards that we build on a daily basis. But understanding your audience and how the dashboard will be used is still very crucial. So some important questions to ask are, is the dashboard gonna be exploratory or explanatory? That's the main one, right? How are they gonna use it? And then, you know, are they looking at different tabs? Do they think they have different tabs in their minds? And if so, it's probably a plus, like Hobbs said, if you can get your users to space stuff out, it's cleaner. You can kind of group certain things together for certain audiences. Um, also ask, you know, do you have any color palettes or fonts, you know, branding requirements that we need to meet up front so you're not going back through and changing colors at the very end, right? So the most important question here, though, is exploratory versus explanatory. Now, the audience usually dictates whether the dashboard will be one of these. So in a lot of cases, when I'm building dashboards, it's both, right? They want a dashboard for the executives and they want a dashboard for the analysts, but they want it in one workbook. Um, so this is where tabs come in handy. So an overview or KPI tab with minimal interaction is handy for executives. And then an, an analyst is want, gonna want something with a lot of filters, parameters, you know, action filters. Um, so let's look at some examples of exploratory and explanatory dashboards that I have on public. Um, so this one's from Evalytics. So this is an explanatory example. Um, it's the 2020 ELO basketball predictor performance. So this dashboard very clearly tells you its purpose. It's to display how our ELO machine learning model did in the 2020 season at predicting winners of NCAA basketball games. I have a really long title. I have a subtitle, like it's very clear exactly what's happening. Um, it's very clean. I've got a lot of spacing. Um, there's no interactivity right here. Like what you see is what you get. So this is an example of like execs would come here, look at it and then leave, right? Um, it also has summary in the title. It's letting you know that it's just an overview. So let's look at an exploratory example. So I built this a few years ago. Um, this is exploring homelessness in America. Now this is much more interactive and allows the user to choose the metric, the year. You can even click on a state and that'll filter the trend charts. It's also much more densely packed with information. You know, it's kind of crammed in there. I'm trying to fit it on one, one sheet. Uh, it takes more time to digest, right? And it has exploring in the title. So this would be, you know, an exploratory example. So knowing your audience, right? An analyst would like this better. All right, so let's get into the data. Now in this section, we try to capture pertinent information about the data for the dashboard. If engineering is required, then you may want to have a separate requirements gathering session just for that. Um, so here are the main questions that we ask. So the big one, is there currently a data source and are the structure and contents sufficient for this dashboard? So if not, what does that ideal data source look like? Now it's really important that you get the data into a format that's gonna work for your visuals, right? Like if you have something, you know, a long skinny table and you need columns for stuff, like you're gonna have to pivot that um, so it's really important up front, you're not doing rework on the data. So is data engineering going to be needed? Um, what granularity is going to be needed? So your tables might be at a certain level of granularity, but you don't actually need that in the dashboard. So you have a chance to aggregate that up, right? So clarify that up front so you're not bogging down your data source with unnecessary levels. Um, will there be single or multiple tables, files? You know, are we joining or unioning or blending anything here? And then how large is the data set? We want to know if we're going to have to consider some performance improvements. Um, 
And sometimes we encounter a situation where the data source won't even be ready for a while, but the stakeholders want a dashboard as soon as it is. And so in these situations, what we've done in the past is create a mock-up data source in Google Sheets to develop with and then swap the data sources out when it's ready. I really like Google Sheets for like anything ad hoc. It connects live connection to Tableau. Um, it's really easy to set up. You can union, you can join. Um, it's awesome. I love Google Sheets. So this method can also be helpful when you're unsure what the structure of the data source needs to be for Tableau. The data engineering team or you, you know, if you're doing the SQL, can then use it as a template to kind of back engineer your code, right? Okay, so I built my dashboard. This is my sample data set. All right, now I can take the base tables and then make my ag table or whatever in this format. So that's really handy. Uh, another thing we like to ask is about existing reporting. So frequently our dashboard projects involve revamping and pivoting existing dashboards to answer new business questions. You know, new fiscal year, we have some new questions. We have an old dashboard, we like some of it, but we wanna, you know, add some new, add some new visuals, new data into it. So this gives us the opportunity to understand what the client is used to seeing and get their feedback on what they like and dislike. So if you're building a brand new dashboard, then have the stakeholder show you some examples of the dashboard they like or show some examples of dashboards you have built. You know, if there's not anything existing, just bring some examples. So the question here, you know, give us examples of what you like and dislike um, and dashboards made to replace or augment. Um, so publishing and sharing. So this isn't totally necessary in the requirements gathering meeting, but they are necessary as you approach your first iteration. Uh, so keep in mind that your deadlines may dictate when you ask these questions. You know, we're just looking for here, you know, where is it going to be published on server? What's it going to be named? What's like, what's the first target date? Uh, any default filters need to be applied? Any row level security? That might be more of a data question, but you know, stuff like that. Um, so miscellaneous. So I just have this section at the bottom for any comments that the stakeholders, you know, have during the meeting that kind of don't fall into the other categories. I can just go right to the bottom, type it in and go back to my section. Um, and then also just one last chance, you know, is there anything else we need to know about this project? You know, think about it for a minute or two, anything we should know. So the result, so this template, um, it's a streamlined process for gathering requirements that helps you ask, you as the developer, ask the right questions to understand the business value of the dashboard, right? If you understand what they're trying to get um, and help them get there, then it's gonna work out, right? You're gonna build a good dashboard. So I've had multiple stakeholders say they love the thoroughness of this process, you know, stuff they've never thought of this early, and it gets their mind flowing, um, you know, prevents those, those further iterations down the line where, you know, you put something up and then it sparks like, oh, we can do this and that. If you can start that earlier in the process with these questions, then you don't need to go through as many iterations of the dashboard to get the final product. So following this template should jumpstart your dashboards while also showing your stakeholders that you are organized and prepared for the project. It's always good to let them know that you've got control. So you can find the template, um, that short template on our website uh, in our new blog post. And so that's the website. And you can follow me on Twitter at that guy. So I just retweet a lot of Sean stuff. So you're not missing much, but you can still follow me. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. <laughs> All right, I've got a, I've got a few um, questions in the Q and A. So will that Tableau requirement sheet be sent out? And then yeah, same thing. This template is awesome. Where can we find it? If you just go to that website, analytics.com slash blog, it should be, I think there's a pinned post and I think it's the one right below that. Um, so if you go there and then, you know, scroll to the bottom, there's a link, link to it. Cool. There was one, uh, there was one comment uh, in the, in the chat that I wanted to kind of uh, bring to your attention and just see if you had any thoughts on it. Um, somebody said, you know, the thing that they, uh, they kind of struggle with a lot is uh, if explanatory dashboards uh, will lead people to wanting exploratory dashboards. For sure. And that's, again, that's the benefit of tabs. Um, so you can have like a, a starter tab, even if you will, where, you know, somebody can kind of look at something and find something interesting. And then you can even use like action filters to jump to an exploratory tab. And we'll do that a lot with like case level deep, case level data, like, you know, customer service, 
um, we want to see the aggregate of like how you know different groups are performing and how our ratings are and then you know drill down maybe a little bit into like managers and then oh i want to see like every single case that this manager is seeing and so you click on that it jumps you to like a case level table maybe some more visuals but you know a lot of times it's a table um worksheet that's already filtered for that specific, specific manager and then you have that that exploratory level detail there so use action filters for sure um, for that kind of stuff. Very cool. Okay, anything else? All right, turn it back over to Sean. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's get this going here. So uh, thanks everybody, uh, had some great content. So I'm really excited to uh, share talking about new set actions. Uh, well, not new set actions, uh, new functionality with set actions. Uh, came out in 2020.2. Uh, um, so really looking forward to what people can do with this. Uh, so this is our dashboard. Um, and what we're gonna be able to do is <clears throat> we now have the ability through, interact through interactivity to remove dimension members uh, from a set. So originally when set actions were first uh, introduced, uh, we were able to do a lot of, you know, you could just click around and you could add all these to the set. But if you wanted to remove things from the set, it was a little bit difficult uh, to do. Uh, and now there's a native uh, functionality in Tableau to remove those things from the set. So now over here, you can see a list view of everything that you've put inside the set. And if you want to remove one thing or another, you can just click uh, to do that. And it also works with uh, it also works with click and drag to remove. And similarly, uh, you can click to add uh, to do that. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about: uh, how to kind of build something like this. Um, so first thing uh, that we do, we can put our uh, we can make a state map just like that. Now I've created uh, a state set. And the way that you do that, right click on your dimension, go to create, create a set. And for this, uh, you know, you can just, uh, you can just add in as many or as few as you want, doesn't really matter. Uh, just for the, for the sake of validation, we'll change it later. Um, give this a name. Uh, we'll call live, we'll call this state demo, click OK, just like that. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this set, I'm going to put it on color, just like that. And I could change my colors now if I wanted to, but now I'm going to, uh, now I'm just going to create my new set action. So, I'm going to go to worksheet actions, create a new set action, change set values. So depending on your version, um, if you don't have set actions, uh, this will look completely new to you. If you have the, if you have an older version of set actions, uh, this will look a little bit uh, new and it's this section right here. Uh, this clearing the selection will, um, and we have three options now. So when I, so right now I'm on sheet six. I select my data source. There's only one data source in it. I select this. I select the set that I want to add things to. And then I want. And then I can just uh, choose which option I want. Right. So right now it's on assign values to the set. Whenever I run the action or click in this case, uh, the difference between assign values to the set and add values to the set are going to be um, assigned value means that is the set, end of story. Uh, add values to the set would be more like an append to the set, add to the set. So that's what I wanna do. I wanna add to the set and then by default, Tableau will say, okay, if you're adding things to the set, you are going to probably continue looking at that set. Uh, so we're going to keep the set values. Uh, which is what that, which is what we want. So we'll call this our, 
demo action, demo add, I should say, add action, just like that. Click OK. And now when I click on things, things are being added to the set. So I'm going to give you a nickel's worth of free advice here. And this is, if there's one thing that you take away, let's say you don't have uh, set actions, you don't yet have this version of Tableau, here's the one thing everybody can take away. Have you ever noticed that when you select something, this stays highlighted? Uh, and it's always like, well, how do I get rid of this highlighting? I don't want that highlighting anymore. So what you need to do, I'm going to teach you how you can do that right now, and it's going to blow your mind. So you go, you go create two simple dimensions uh, columns. It can be whatever you want. I just use one and zero. Some people use highlight and unhighlight. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it can be whatever you want, but they do need to be discrete dimensions. So I just did uh, I just did a zero. I did another one as a one. That's all you got to do. I'm going to take both of these and I'm going to drag them onto detail, just like that. Now I'm going to create a new worksheet action. I'm going to create a filter action. I'm just going to select the sheet for the for this sake. Here's another quick tip. If you have a lot of sheets here, you can control all and press the space one time and that will unselect everything. And then you can click on the one thing that you want. That's a pretty fun one. Uh, I'm going to run the action on select. My source sheet is this. I'm going to, uh, clearing the selection, we'll leave the filter. All right, here's where the magic happens. Instead of all fields, you're just going to do selected fields. I select my data source field one. My target is field source zero. Now, what does this mean? This means that I want to filter this where one equals zero. Does that ever happen? No, it does not. So now, because I have, because I've coupled this with a set action, when I click on a state now, everything goes away. That's not the way that I wanted it. <laughs> uh, let's see. So I did the exact same, maybe it has to be on a dashboard, but set it up the exact same way. Here, I'll even show you. I did uh, right here. So uh, not that one, that's my, work, that's my worksheet filter. Here we go. So on the dashboard to that sheet, so not the, not the sheet on the dashboard, but to the actual sheet, one equals zero. Click OK. Now, when you select something, all it does is highlight, and you don't get that highlighting action. Um, it just colors it like you want it to, which is really cool. All right. So that's how you build that. That's how you build the, uh, the map sheet. The way that I built the uh, and then to get that little list over here, uh, basically what I did here, we'll just go here and make it simple. Uh, we'll go here to our sheet, show you how I set this up. So first thing you notice, I've got things in the set. Uh, what I've got is showing the in and out of set and I'm showing only what's in the set. I've also got that in, uh, in the rows. And then I have the actual state in rows. Now what you notice is that I don't, I'm not showing any row headers. So if I show things like this, right? So if you are familiar with sometimes building some things, um, what I really wanna do is I wanna highlight this entire cell. And this is where these little, uh, these little dummy uh, placeholder fields so this is a, a square. So that's, so by doing that, what you can do if I expand my view, right? So this looks bad. This is not what I want, but I do want it to be a square because I want it to fill in that space. So that's what those, that's what those two empty text 
uh, fields are going to do is they're going to add additional dimensions at a higher level. And then you can just format that, the width to be exactly what you want. And then you can unshow that header again. And now you have that. And then the last thing that I did to, to actually get that X to show up is I just did an in shelf calculation um, where I just did a uh, space, an X, two spaces, and then I had to play with this. Um, you just kind of make whatever works. Um, I, but I really wanted that to make look make it look like an X. So this is a way that you can kind of just speak to, um, you know, to do a callback to Hobbs uh, presentation. This is how you can do actually some uh, iconography right inside uh, some of your uh, some of your dashboards. So obviously, again, the X usually means remove. Uh, so that's why I added that there. And then I just concatenated that 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 simple string uh, to my state field. Uh, and that's how I was able to do that. So really cool way. I've seen a lot of people use these uh, in really interesting ways. Um, you know, if you've ever needed you know, I've seen some people do some really crazy things with uh, breadcrumbs. So if you're going, if you're doing a lot of filtering um, and you're trying to create a breadcrumb of what's exactly in context uh, of your dashboard, um, I've seen some people do some really cool things with, um, with these new add and remove dashboard uh, set actions. So the last thing that I wanna show you is how you set up the remove. Um, so that is simple. You just say, uh, this is my sheet, the members in set, which is this sheet right here on select. And as you can see, I've just selected that to be remove from the set. Uh, and then I keep the set values there. So really cool way that you can use uh, set actions uh, to, again, improve the overall user interface and user experience um, for your uh, for your users. So definitely check that out. <clears throat> Where did I get this? Um, this is, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, this was a recent Workout Wednesday challenge that I posted a couple weeks back. Um, and what I, uh, I can't speak highly enough of this community, uh, this Workout Wednesday community. Um, basically what it is, if you're not familiar, um, is a, it's how to learn Tableau. Um, it, I owe a lot of my success in Tableau to this, um, to this website and to this challenge. Basically what it is, uh, you get a, here's the introduction to the challenge. Here's what you're going to build. And here are the requirements to do it. Um, that's it. And here's the data. Right, so it's your job to take this, take this challenge, take these requirements, and do as best you can to uh, replicate exactly what it's doing. And one of the great things about Workout Wednesday is all of Tableau uh, public is downloadable. Um, so take it as far as you can by yourself. Then, once you're stuck and you've hit a roadblock, download the copy of this and start reverse engineering it. Say, okay, how did I do this? Uh, a lot of the little simple tricks uh, that I found or that I showed you, uh, you know, with the, uh, the two blank headers, um, with the uh, unhighlight uh, action, all of that I learned from completing challenges uh, like this and revert, downloading workbooks and reverse engineering um, the challenges and working through them. I have a much better uh, understanding of how Tableau works and why Tableau does what it does uh, because I've gone through uh, so many of these challenges. So you can pick up wherever you, uh, wherever you want. And there are three years, let me think. Yes, three years worth of challenges uh, in the backlog. Um, so really all types of data, all types of challenges. Um, every single level of domain. So table calculations, level of detail calculations, all those things are covered uh, within these challenges. So definitely wanna check those out uh, if you want to and uh, start learning why Tableau does what it does. So um, 
with that, I'll say uh, go forth and viz. So let me uh, check out the Q&A. Let's see, where are you, Q&A? Uh, maybe I need to stop my share first. There it is, yes. All right. Uh, wonderful ad, okay. Can you clarify the sit action only worked in a dashboard, not on a sheet? Uh, that was, the sit action will work. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, I kind of did this live. It will work on a sheet. Uh, I just kind of have to figure out exactly how to do it, um, but it, it, it will work. I, I, yes, absolutely. Uh, next, how, do, how long do I typically spend on a workout Wednesday? Well, let me show you. Uh, so if I were building this and I had not built this the way that it was, here's what I'm going to do. So the first thing that I do is I'm going to look at this. I'm going to say, what do I recognize? I recognize three stack bar charts and I recognize a map. I know how to make a stack bar chart. I know how to make a map. I don't really know exactly how to do it in this context, but I know how to do it. So I know I'm gonna make three bar charts and I know I'm gonna uh, create a map. I've also got this list over here and I can see by looking at it um, that it is, it is an additional sheet. Uh, so this is just a list sheet. Uh, so, okay, I know I'm gonna do those things. And then it's just kind of, what kind of happens if I click around? Okay, I'm gonna start, if I click those, so now I start thinking of interactivity. And then I just start to, I just start to kind of work backwards uh, once I know the chart types. Uh, and then for those little details, um, you know, those little formatting tricks that I showed you, the unhighlight, check highlight, uh, those types of things, that's, that is where I'll get in there and I'll download the workbook uh, and kind of look for those, look for those things. How, how long do I typically spend? Depends on the challenge. There's some, there are some ridiculously hard challenges in there. There are some super easy ones. Um, I would say on average, uh, probably, sorry, not average, my median time, right? Uh, that's more accurate. Uh, my median time would probably anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour um, per challenge. So, uh, you know, don't go crazy with it. Don't, you know, don't break, a, break out in a sweat trying to complete it. Um, don't even, you don't even really, there's nothing even saying that you have to even, complete it. You can just download the workbook from the challenge and just reverse engineer it. See how they did a few things. Spend as little or as much time on it as you want. Uh, and then also don't hesitate to reach out to the community, uh, Twitter, the forums, wherever, uh, and ask your question if you've got, if you've got one. And will I provide a link to the website? Uh, sure, I'll do that. It's uh, workout-wednesday.com. Uh, but I can definitely uh, put that in there. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Uh, I don't the, see any more. So, I think that just about wraps it up. Um, this this tug. So, thank you so much. A um, couple of last final thoughts from me before I kick it to the rest of the, uh, the panel. Uh, we are targeting our next virtual tug uh, sometime the week of August 24th. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and if you're not yet signed up for uh, getting those uh, emails, uh, please head over to uh, usergroups.tableau.com slash Kansas City uh, and uh, you'll be able to get, um, you'll be able to get signed up to receive all the cool stuff. So um, last final thoughts from uh, anybody else before we sign off for today? Uh, I think Sean was good. All right, cool. All right, thanks so much Kansas City, appreciate it. And uh, we'll be talking. Yep.